dice isso é tudo o que eu sei de português. <risos> is a, a shrinking number of benefits to being an academic physician. One of the benefits is to train young people and you see them go to their home and they uh, are successful, they flourish, and it's a great pleasure to be here with Eduardo Miranda, Bruno Nascimento, um, and my ex-fellows who spent some time with me in New York. I've also known Eduardo uh, Bertero for 23 years. We were fellows together with Bruno Goldstein. So you've heard a lot of what I'm going to say already with the excellent talks we've had today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some background as to why the statements say what they say, okay? So most importantly, there is nothing on this slide that relates me to a testosterone product company. In fact, to be on the testosterone guidelines panel, <coughs> The AUA insisted on everyone having zero, zero conflict with the testosterone company. And we have to stay that way for one year after the publication of the guideline. And I think this is really, really important. You may be aware of the increasing concern of the influence of industry on the development of guideline statements. So we had 13 members. It was multidisciplinary. There were urologists. There were there was an epidemiologist, there were methodologists, cardiologists, endocrinologists, internal medicine, laboratory medicine people. Okay? We had 15 PICO questions. It was a systematic review with meta-analysis. To the best of my knowledge, of all the testosterone guidelines, only the AUA and the Endocrine Society are meta-analyses, which are weighting evidence as opposed to sitting around the table and experts <coughs> making decisions without a meta-analysis. Very important. 15,000 references, ultimately over 500 references in the final document. You have probably seen the guidelines. There are statements, but on the website of the AUA, there is a lot of supporting text, which if you're really interested, you need to read that. So we use testosterone level, total T, two levels, early morning, 300 as a cutoff. And the word reasonable is in the guideline statement as a reasonable cutoff because we understand that there are men who are between 300 and 400 who are highly symptomatic. And the problem in the testosterone space is that we don't know where most men were 20 years ago. 55 years of age, walks in, I have no idea what his testosterone level was when he was 30. And the delta, the change between when he was young and now is probably the most important factor in determining whether his testosterone level is low or not. This is why I'm sure you see men who are 70 years of age whose testosterone levels are 900, and men who are 30 years of age whose testosterone levels are 280 and neither of them have symptoms. There is no age reference ranges. We want a low T diagnosis made with two testosterone levels in an early morning fashion to account for the circadian rhythm and the intra-individual variation. The term testosterone deficiency refers to low serum testosterone level with symptoms and or signs. Just because somebody has a low testosterone doesn't mean that they are deficient. Again, because I don't know what his testosterone level was many years ago. Statement number five says you should not use validated instruments. The aging, the antrum deficiency, the aging male questionnaire, the Adam, and the AMS, or the NARI questionnaire from Ray Rosen, because their sensitivity is high but their specificity is very low. In fact, when used in clinical practice, their specificity is probably no better than 25%. Meaning that if somebody has positive questionnaires, that they have about a one in four chance of having low testosterone. That the symptoms on the Morley questionnaire, okay, there are 10 questions. I routinely have five of them, because I'm tired all the time. And so they're not very specific. This is a very important slide in your clinical practice. 
These are conditions where we believe you should be checking testosterone level. And there is data to support checking testosterone level in these populations, even if the patient has no symptoms or signs. Unexplained anemia, bone density loss, low trauma, bone fracture, diabetes, exposure to chemotherapy, testicular radiation, HIV AIDS, chronic narcotic use, chronic corticosteroid use, male infertility and pituitary dysfunction. Not on here at this point in time is the presence of a barrel because the literature is just too weak at this point in time. With the low T, we think you should check an LH level, a luteinizing hormone. You do a testosterone level, it's low. You repeat the testosterone level, probably best done with the free testosterone level, and you check an LH. We say the guideline that you should not use a free testosterone level as the primary means of diagnosing testosterone deficiency. Okay? And the reason for that is that most of the literature has used calculated testosterone to look at free levels. And the calculated testosterone levels have coefficients of variation that range between 15 and 30%. They are not very reliable. 